Hola y bienvenidos. Welcome to our look back at Hispanic Heritage Month 2023. Our special KVU Plus local program includes the many feature stories we brought you during this year's Hispanic Heritage Month celebration in September and October. And what a celebration it's been. From stories about the rich and vibrant Hispanic culture to a look at the innovators, pioneers, and Hispanic Americans who have made a difference in the lives of everyone. It's all coming up. But first, a look back in time. KVU's Bob Buckaloo traces the history of the growth of Texas's Hispanic population and the struggle for justice and equal representation at the places of power. The history of Latinos in Central Texas was carved in the soil of the farmlands outside Austin. At the beginning of the 20th century, most worked as farmhands, many taking the place of black slaves who had been freed decades before. And even though the ties between Texas and Mexico had existed for centuries, Latinos in Texas were looked down upon and often subjected to violence at the hands of whites. According to historians William Kerrigan and Clive Webb, from 1910 to 1920, 5,000 Latinos in the U.S. were murdered in a wave of terror many by the Texas Rangers, which began as a militia, funded and supported by white ranchers who wanted more land and hated their Spanish-speaking neighbors. Lynchings of Latino men and women took place on hanging trees, like this one that still grows outside the Goliad County Courthouse, 130 miles from Austin. And just as black Americans fled rural violence in Texas, Latinos too were drawn to the relative safety of the capital city. Austin, Texas, 1900. Of the 23,000 people who lived here then, only about 500 were of Mexican heritage. In central Texas, they helped build the railroads, tended to the crops of white farm owners, and worked as cowboys or vaqueros on the big ranches to the south and west of the city. But it was the Mexican Revolution of 1910 that saw Austin's Latino population swell. Millions of Mexican refugees fled the violence and crossed into Texas, spreading out across the U.S. By 1930, Austin's Latino population had risen to 5,000. Yet despite their numbers, discrimination did not end. Local schools for Latino children were poorly funded. The doors to political representation were locked, and finding a safe place to live was difficult. Newspaper advertisements for New Austin neighborhoods like Hyde Park were filled with language that made it clear that there was no place for Latinos or Blacks. In an article in the March 1913 Bulletin of the University of Texas, William B. Hamilton wrote, Between Congress Avenue on the east and Rio Grande Street on the west, Fourth Street on the north and the river on the south is a section which may be called the Mexican District. Bordering this section on the south, he wrote, is the main city dumping ground. The Latinos have all the filthy habits described already, but you must add to them the worst filth of the dump. The Second World War would signal a turning point. Many thousands of Latinos from Austin and from across Texas would volunteer to fight. Some would become decorated heroes only to return home and find themselves treated with disdain and disrespect. They had served their country just as white soldiers had and came home from the war determined to gain access to all this country has to offer. Organizations like LULAC, the League of Latin American Citizens, had been working to end discrimination since its founding in the 1920s and took on new importance in the post-war years. The GI Forum played an active role in assuring better educational opportunities and increased voting rights for Latinos. By the 1950s, the doors slowly began opening to political representation. In 1956, Henry B. Gonzalez came to Austin to serve in the Texas Senate, the first Latino to do so. But colleagues referred to him as that Mexican. And according to his biography, Gonzalez found himself fighting regular attempts by the legislature to circumvent national civil rights legislation. And Austin remained a city divided. The construction of Interstate 35, which had the effect of cutting off predominantly Latino and black neighborhoods on the east side from the prosperous Central Business District. It was both a symbolic and actual barrier. Many Latino children attended Palm School with a park and swimming pool nearby, but Latino children were not allowed to swim with the whites. By the 1970s, activism in Austin reached a peak. 
the Chicano movement, the Raza Unida political party, solidarity with striking farm workers led by Cesar Chavez who fought to improve the working conditions of Latinos who worked in the fields. It was a time of reawakening and for some, social revolution was in the air. In Austin in the late 1970s, a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood in East Austin fought back against drag boat races in nearby Town Lake. The noise and crowds disrupted their homes every summer during a citywide event known as Aquafest. It was a popular celebration to many, but it was the boat races that divided the community throughout the 70s. Neighbors pleaded with city council to ban the races. But when it came time for the council to decide, by a vote of four to three, the races were allowed to continue. And when the boat races returned to Town Lake in 1978, fights broke out. Eventually, victory, the races would be moved to a location far away from East Austin. The 1970s would also see political progress. Richard Moya became the first Hispanic Travis County Commissioner when he was elected in 1970. At the time, no Latino had ever been elected to public office in Austin government. Gus Garcia was elected to the Austin School Board that same year. He would later become Austin's first Latino mayor in 2001. In 1975, more political victories. Gonzalo Parientos was elected to the Texas Legislature and John Trevino to the Austin City Council. From the Austin of 1900 to the Austin of today, there's a rich and vibrant history of Latinos in our city and stories of the vital contributions they've made to everyone's lives. Stories to be remembered and stories yet to be told. Bob Buckaloo, KVU News. Bob mentioned growing political representation as more Hispanic Americans have been elected to local school boards and as city council members, state lawmakers, and judges. I met a judge in Travis County who reached her position in the courtroom despite seemingly overwhelming odds. Denise Hernandez doesn't follow in anyone's footsteps. She paves her own path. I was the first person in my family who graduated high school uh, and then went to college. She's also the family's first lawyer. It's a far cry from her childhood. Growing up in Houston, the daughter of Mexican immigrants, Hernandez became all too familiar with courtrooms. My dad in the immigration system, but also in and out of the criminal justice system, my mom experiencing eviction. These interactions with the legal system were really hard and they were traumatic. She felt her parents couldn't get fair representation. My dad has a really thick accent. My mom was really timid in these spaces, and it's really easy in those situations to just forget that people are human. Both having a lasting impact on Hernandez. In fact, it's exactly why she became a lawyer. Fast forward to January of this year, all right. She became known as the Honorable Judge Denise Hernandez, presiding over Travis County Court at Law Number no. Six. I can see it. She handles misdemeanors and leads a youth diversion program called Transformative Youth Justice. I appreciate you being here. It helps 17 to 20 year olds who are in trouble and have pending cases. Just because someone gets arrested for an offense at this young of an age, we can do something to help them, to help change the trajectory of their lives and to remind them that they have the ability to believe in themselves. And that's something she's had to personally learn throughout the years. You know, I didn't come out until I was like 26 years old. Hernandez is the first openly gay Latina to serve a county court bench in Travis County, a title she proudly holds. Especially as queer women of color, it's important to say I'm not hiding any part of myself to be accepted. I want to be accepted for the wholeness of who I am. The first time my wife met my family, she was like, why is everyone yelling? And I said, oh, actually, this is not yelling. This is quite normal. We, we all talk very loud. <laughs> her voice. I'm going to ask you some pretty standard legal questions. Has served her well. Hernandez has dedicated her career to public service and breaking generational cycles, specifically when it comes to education. Once uh, I broke through that ceiling, then my sibling went to college, and then my younger uh, cousins began to go to college. And it's really just about believing in yourself uh, and knowing that your story, your lived experience can actually create a lot of impactful change. Hispanic heritage is celebrated in cities large and small across America, and locally, not only in Austin, but in Bastrop too, where a museum honors the contributions of Mexican-Americans there. KVU's Eric Pointer has more.
the quest for a fair education. This is something worth worth uh, fighting for. Led to some big changes that some aren't even aware of. They have no idea. It's almost like it's been that way forever and it hasn't been that way forever. In 1948, the Delgado family tried to get their daughter enrolled into a white school. They said that she wasn't getting a proper education at the Mexican school. When she was denied, they sued Bastrop ISD and three other Central Texas districts and won. The lawsuit also set a precedent for the 1954 Supreme Court decision that declared all segregation in public schools unconstitutional. And we want to, that's why we call it celebrate and educate. We're celebrating the decision and we're educating people that you, sometimes you have to do what you have to do to get what, what is right. The celebration put on by Bastrop ISD Performing Arts Center will have free lunch and music and other events to honor the rich culture. In Bastrop, Eric Pointer, KVU News. The crunch of a taco, the warmth of an enchilada. Who doesn't love Mexican food? Well, there's an old Spanish saying that goes, el amor entra por el estómago. Love enters through the stomach. And in this next story, it's a love of food and family that's brought one Austin business a great deal of success. Shopping at the grocery store often involves looking at the nutritional labels on the back. But when you flip this product over, you'll come across a family photo. We chose the name Siete because there's seven members in my family and this business really did start because my whole family sort of came together and helped me get through you know, some of these problems. The problems Veronica Garza is referring to, achy joints, just like extreme fatigue, are health related. As a teenager, she was diagnosed with several autoimmune conditions. The one that people would probably be most familiar with is lupus. So Veronica took action. At her brother's insistence, she began to change up her diet and got creative in the kitchen. Using things like almond flour and different grain-free flours to try to recreate things um, that would allow me to eat the food that I that I would normally eat. The next thing she knew, Veronica's entire family from Laredo joined her on her mission to better health. We had started exercising in my parents' backyard. Through trial and error, Veronica ended up creating a grain-free version of a Mexican staple, a tortilla made with almond flour. It was really just, I want to eat tacos on <laughs> something other than a piece of lettuce. I want to make enchiladas. I want to be able to enjoy all of these foods. She recruited her mom and spent countless afternoons hand pressing tortillas in the kitchen. Finally, she was ready to test them out. I made a batch of tortillas. I drove up I-35 from Laredo up to Austin and we took them to one small co-op in town called Wheatsville. We actually had a meeting on the grocery floor, like very informal. They were a hit. By 2014, Siete Family Foods became a full-fledged business a business that turned into the fastest growing Mexican-American food brand in the nation. We're currently at about 80 products, sweets like cookies and pantry staples like beans and crispy taco shells, potato chips, botana sauces, salsas. It's really important for us that um, people are able to eat and enjoy Mexican-American food um, without feeling like they're compromising. That dedication to health and taste caught the attention of some familiar faces. Have you ever tried these Siete? Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm obsessed. obsessed with Siete. I'm equally excited when I go to the grocery store and I see someone like putting our products in their basket. Like I just have this moment where I'm like, should I say something? Like, <laughs> And while Veronica is certainly happy for Siete's success, she wants to help those who are in the same position she once was. Especially other, La other Latinos who um, aspire to start businesses. I think we want to be an example for them that they can get there too, because I really do believe that when one of us rises, we're all rising together. Their dishes, being Puerto Rican and Venezuelan, and my wife Peruvian, are described as a fusion. We have all of those countries' ingredients in our food. Food you can find. Do you want to do a fatty? When you order uh, yeah. Yeah. from Plantain Bar. So I'll send you a message when that's ready, all right? A Puerto Rican food truck parked on South First Street in Austin. Created by Lenny and his wife Jojo. <laughs> we had a couple drinks, you know how that leads to it, and we bought a bunch of equipment to do pop ups. Serving up a variety of fresh fusion dishes since 2021.
I grew up eating a lot of Puerto Rican food and Venezuelan food, so we try to have like a base of what we're used to. We use a lot of Peruvian spicy peppers in our, in our food, so we try to kind of mix everything together. Plantains, otherwise known as platanos, are a staple in the Puerto Rican diet. Made as sweet or savory. The greens are saltier, the black and the yellow ones are sweeter. So we figured, let's play off of that. How do you want your plantain? How do you like your plantain? You like it bitter, you like it salty, you like it sweet? So we figured, yeah, why not? Plantain bar. The couple says they didn't find many food options that fuse together different Latin cultures. Their solution to fix that has resulted in customers grateful for a little taste of home. A lot of them haven't had this food in so long, and they're like, oh my God, this reminds me of my family, yeah. uh, my mother. They always say, oh, my mom, my mom, you know? I love like, that. Or home. I love that. It's like, oh, this feels like home, but different. That's it. While also attracting the curious first-timers. So they, they read our menu and they ask us questions and... You know, some of them never even seen a plantain before. Okay. With all dishes 100% gluten free, a little bit of salt, and offering vegan and vegetarian options, Lenny and JoJo say they hope introducing Puerto Rican and Venezuelan culture to Austin broadens everyone's minds of what Spanish food can be. It's a lot of hard work, but you know, life isn't easy, and all the good things in life are hard. You got to work for it. Once you get to a point where you're working every day and you're you're doing it, and people are loving it. That's when it pays off. Yeah, you want to do a side? And the co-owners will continue paying their heritage forward, making room for those inspired to follow in their footsteps. Or should I say, tire tracks. It's going to be the crazy cow. Reporting in South Austin, Patty Lechon. Dominique Newland, yeah. KVU so, News. Thank you. Every year, Mexican communities celebrate the tradition of Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, in November. But Austin's Mexicarte Museum started its celebration in September. This year is special because just a few weeks ago, the museum kicked off its 40th celebration of the holiday. The museum began honoring its first Dia de los Muertos in 1984. And since then, it has grown to become the longest running celebration of its type in Texas. To honor its history, the museum opened an exhibit displaying photos, newspaper articles, and other mementos from 1984. Sylvia Orozco, the museum's executive director, said the wall honors decades of effort to connect Hispanic and non-Hispanic communities. To commemorate our family, our loved ones, and to make it public, to make this, that this is part of our cultura mexicana, pero también lo queremos compartir. We are sharing it with, with Austin. From the tradition of Mexican art and Dia de los Muertos to honoring vibrant Spanish music, I bet you would agree there are a few sounds that are more captivating than mariachis. KVU's Kelsey Sanchez found a school where that music is alive and well. The sounds of trumpets and guitars flow through the halls of Travis High School. It's not your typical band. A small group of students on campus learning the tunes of mariachi, but in a more modern way. What drew senior Jonathan Hernandez to the group was the style. Mariachi was so different from anything I've heard. What made him stay was his roots. Since my dad's from Mexico, I felt like it would have been nice to be able to play something for him. And so I joined it just to like know it. And if he ever asked if I knew this song, I could try and play it with the like style of mariachi. Embracing old and new songs, still holding true to the genre. For others like Sahana Demune, it's a chance to find themselves. I, I grew up not really knowing much of who I was what my culture was about, why is it so important, and why people do this, you know, for certain reasons, like traditions and everything. Um, that's why it's like, I want to be able to do things so I can find out myself. And connect through music. We're a part of something big and we're still holding the history of it up. History in Central Texas dating back to 1972, when former Austin Mayor Gus Garcia found his love for mariachi through a festival in San Antonio sparking an idea to bring culture into the classrooms of Austin ISD. But at the time, it wasn't a style that was taught. Fate would have to play a part. We have a guy that wants a mariachi program. We have a guy that knows how to play it. 
And so we started this. The first mariachi programs in the school district officially launched by Austin-born maestro Zeke Castro at Fulmore Middle School and Travis High School. He had never taught mariachi before he started here at Fulmore in 79. A path assistant band director Jonathan Rodriguez found himself in and happily followed. <laughs> Learning mariachi doesn't have to be dated or exclusive. There's times it's like, being in mariachi, I kind of feel more of myself um, rather than, you know, having to try hard to be like other people or just likable. It only needs to be celebrated. In Austin, I'm Kelsey Sanchez, KVU News. It's not just art and music that frame Hispanic culture. Dance is a major part of the heritage. KVU's Matt Fernandez has a story of an Austin Center for Puerto Rican Culture, a place where dance reigns supreme. This is the Puerto Rican Cultural Center's performing company. Made up of more than 20 dancers and musicians. Dr. Ana Maria Tacana Maynard is the executive and artistic director of the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. It says the mission of the center is... And we are preserving and transmitting Puerto Rican culture here to Central Texas, not only to share it with ourselves and um, our cultural center community, but also to bring cultural awareness to all of Central Texas. The performing company's music and dances are native to Puerto Rico. They do two major performances for the public each year. Dances from the mountains of Puerto Rico that represent the people who were the extension of the Taino people with a mixture of Spanish and African heritage. Bomba and plena, a lot of people have heard of that and it's mostly drums, handheld drums for the plena. Maynard is very proud of her heritage. People that are very joyful, generous, welcoming, embracing. We love people. As it's Hispanic Heritage Month, Maynard sending this message about the performing company and the cultural center. Porting each other as a community. And it's not just limited to us, Puerto Ricans, we are open and embracing. If you feel called to be part of this beautiful, loving, joyful community, we're happy to have you. In Austin, Matt Fernandez, KV News. Well, next up on our celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month on KVU Plus, three Hispanic American pioneers in Central Texas who brought entertainment, education, and information to everyone. First, a Hispanic woman in Austin who had a dream of bringing bilingual education to children across America via television. Then, his big band is still thriving. The amazing story of Nash Hernandez and his impact on Central Texas music lovers. And later, you may remember him on KV News long ago, Ron Oliveira, the first Hispanic TV news anchorman in Austin. We're going to see what he's up to today. But first, Bob Buckaloo takes us back to a children's TV show that many consider to be revolutionary. If you were a kid in the 1970s and watched a public broadcasting channel in your town, you may have come across a very different kind of kid's show. Vamos a estar en Carrascolindas, Carrascolindas, Carrascolindas. Welcome to Carrasco Lendas, a village that existed inside the large TV studios of what was then known as KLRN, located on the drag in Austin. From inside this building came the first ever English-Spanish bilingual TV series for children, over 200 episodes in all. It was broadcast nationwide on PBS from 1970 to 1976. Carrasco Lindis was the idea of Austin's Ida Barrera, who started her public TV journey in 1962, hosting bilingual education shows beamed to schools across Texas. 
But Ida wanted something more, an enjoyable, fast-paced TV show that mixed Spanish and English songs and dialogue and that featured a cast of unforgettable characters. I actually went to the PBS network and met with a president of PBS and said, you know, I, I think you ought to carry this program. It took a little bit of convincing because he was not convinced. A program in another language? Forget it, you know. But he did it. The lights at Carrasco Lendas were turned off for good in 1976 when federal funding ended. But the old episodes continue to be popular, according to Austin PBS station KLRU, where they can be viewed on the station's website. By the way, was there ever a real Carrasco Lendas? There was, right here in Texas. That's the original name of the town of Rio Grande City, where Ida lived as a child. Bob Buckaloo, KVU News. Turn the calendar back, and this is the type of music that most people listen to. It was called Big Band Music, popular tunes of the day, arranged for a large group of musicians and designed to be danced to. And although the times and tastes in music have changed a lot, there's a band in Austin that honors the big bands of the past. Meet the Nash Hernandez Orchestra, making music since 1949. Although many of the players have come and gone over the past years, the orchestra is still in demand for weddings, parties, and regular gigs at Don's Depot in Austin. It all goes back to Nash Hernandez, an Austinite who founded the orchestra and who became one of the city's best known musicians. He passed away in 1994. And today his son, Ruben Hernandez, helps keep the orchestra going. It's, it's, it's a legacy that I've been proud to carry on. Ruben Hernandez said in the early days of the orchestra, his dad faced discrimination for being a Hispanic musician. But when he first moved into Austin, he tried to join the musicians union and they wouldn't let him in. And he felt it was because he was Hispanic. He told me, that there were times that he had to go not as a Nash Hernandez orchestra but as a Jim Nash band because he was Hispanic. The orchestra gets together regularly in South Austin to practice and to get ready for the next public event. But the biggest event will come next year when they celebrate the 75th anniversary of the orchestra as Nash Hernandez's dream lives on. One song at a time. Darren Shaharan, KVU News. In the meantime, another state official says he will not quit. When it comes to local news, reporters and anchors, well, they come and go. But Ron Oliveira stayed in the capital city and made his mark as the first Latino to anchor a primetime newscast on Austin television. He started as a young reporter from the Rio Grande Valley and was hired by KVU in 1980. Covering stories of all kinds, Ron was known for being a solid and compassionate storyteller and soon became a fixture on people's TV screens, becoming one of the best known evening news anchors in Austin TV history. They were taking a chance. Was putting a Hispanic on the air on a primetime newscast going to drive viewers away? And of course, very proud and very happy to say, no, it didn't happen. So yes, I, I have a lot of pride being the first Hispanic uh, uh, anchor in Austin on a primetime newscast. And look at the diversity that we have now, especially at KVU. Well, today, Ron runs his own public relations and media training company here in Austin and continues to serve the community and serve as a role model for young journalists across the country. As we celebrate the Hispanic people of Central Texas, it's important to also talk about the challenges facing everyone. In this last portion of our special presentation, we'll look at just two of the many challenges that are particularly hard to overcome by our local Hispanic population, access to health care and affordable housing. KVU's Eric Pointer found an Austin clinic working to help older Hispanic Americans get access to the health care they need. 
Good morning morning to you, Doc. Going to the doctor. Any heart palpitations, shortness Mm -hmm. of breath. Can be an overwhelming experience. So I cleaned it off again. But imagine if you didn't speak the same language. My wife does not speak English. Like Angel Camano's wife. She needs somebody who can speak to her in Spanish. He says he's usually there to translate for her, but he appreciates the bilingual staff at Suvida who gives her the freedom to talk directly to her providers. It is very helpful for her to be understood and talk in in Spanish. That's very, very important. But at Suvida, it's more than just talking. It's relating to their background. Through engaging with them in a language that they understand, taking their culture and their habits into consideration. The clinic hosts open houses like this one and other community events to connect with people in the area. They also have their own lab, so it can be a one-stop shop for patients. And each patient has a guide to follow along with their journey and answer any questions along the way in English or Spanish, which Neighborhood Engagement Manager Priscilla Sloan says is vital. You know, I wish that Suvida was around when I took care of my grandfather. I didn't know any of this stuff, so it was very important for me after him passing that I continue helping our seniors. Like Priscilla, most of the staff shares in the rich culture and are able to connect on a deeper level. In South Austin, Eric Pointer, KVU News. Of course, finding affordable housing is an issue facing everyone in our Austin area. KVU's Isabella Basco caught up with a man who's trying to do something about it. John Salinas knows what it's like to struggle while leaning on other family members for help. Born in a family of migrant workers, they traveled throughout the country picking cotton and fruit, and it's an image he carries with him. So it can be a very haunting um, experience for kids when their parents are going through these uh, economic uh, ups and downs. Making him reflect on a time when his father would lend him whatever money he had. He said, you know, this is, this is something I have and I can give it to you. And I might not have it when you need it. So just take it. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was very powerful of understanding that's how he grew up, like that, that he has, you know, he doesn't always have it, but when he does, he's willing to share it. That same spirit of giving he's passing on. This is what's under construction right now. Through his job as the vice president of Spring Architects, developing affordable housing projects in communities of color, one development he's working on is called Juniper Creek in North Austin. It's under construction and will provide 110 units of affordable housing and will share resources with a food pantry and learning center. So it's important for us to to make sure that we design with compassion and understanding the background of where some of the folks, what they've been through, what the struggles they've been. Rebecca Henderson is a stay-at-home mom of three who benefits off projects like these. Money can either be a set of wings or a set of shackles and affordable housing helps give people more wings than chains. A designer who's offering the comforts of home by understanding the past and building the future. In Austin, Isabel Basco for KVU News. And staying on the topic of finding an affordable place to live, KVU's Rob Evans focuses on Austin's Habitat for Humanity. My dream come true. Every time a Texan becomes a new but homeowner with the help of Austin Habitat, Habitat for Humanity, you all are the light of the world. It is a magical <laughs> moment. <laughs> Magic that couldn't happen without those behind the curtain. I could see my mom and she's like so proud that I get to help people have an opportunity that we didn't get to have. That is Angel Leverett, the director of marketing and communication. It's kind of like a dream come true if you think about it. A dream job. These are our two by twelves. Making dreams come true for clients who couldn't do it alone. Our abuelos, our abuelas have taught us. 65 percent of these future homeowners are female-led households. About half of them are Hispanic. Every build season, I feel like there's always a family that I just really resonate with. It resonates because she remembers. I knew we were going to have a very limited amount of food to eat. Angel's mom, like so many in Texas, worked hard, but was simply fighting for the basics. And then rent goes up, and then gas is going up, and then groceries going up. But now, this is my house. This angel, este es mi casita, changes lives. To just play a role to help someone, especially like a beautiful 
mom with a beautiful kid just achieve their dreams of having a forever home like that's something that I don't have the words to fully describe how grateful I am to play a role in that. Put it up on your shoulder. It's a role that keeps expanding. There you go. And we walk through the nonprofit's newest neighborhood being built right now in East Austin. Make a hall. Generational change is happening right here. I know. 90 it's families right just a few way. blocks apart changed forever. Thanks to Angel and thanks to Austin. Because it takes a village. I'll be praying that you receive love and light in return. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rob, for that report. And thank you to the members of the KVU News team, our reporters, photojournalists, producers, and video editors who brought you the sights and sounds of Hispanic Heritage Month 2023. For KVU Plus, I'm Yvonne Nava. Thank you for watching.